Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Spirituality Adventures. Glad you joined us. We have Alan Dietrich with us today, who is the COO of Sporting KC. And we're going we're gonna to talk about... Uh, business career stuff and all that kind of things. But I first wanted to kind of just welcome you to uh, our podcast. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. And maybe give us a little bit of background for people who are listening. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? How did you land in Kansas City? Okay. I grew <laughs> up in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is actually a lot like Kansas City in size and, and a lot of other dynamics. They get our weather about a day and a half after we do. And um, after college, went to Chicago with IBM, then to Denver with IBM, met my wife there, went back to Chicago with IBM and got my master's. Where'd you go to college, by the way? Uh, I went to Miami of Ohio for my undergraduate, and then I went to the University of Chicago for my master's. Uh, they were really strong in the finance side, and that's where I wanted to grow. Wow. And. Um, as I was nearing the end of my master's program, I wanted to move into the software world because back in the late 80s, early 90s, computers were becoming much more and more kind of a, a commodity. And so I found this little software company in Kansas City, which was close to my wife's family called Cerner and um, joined them in 1990 and we had 300 people there. And I thought I might have made the worst mistake of my life getting with a small company that may not, you know, survive. Right. And um, <laughs> it grew like crazy. We doubled in size every year or every other year. Uh, so the growth was almost out of control. And then from there, I, I left after 13 years. I was on staff at a church here in Kansas City, an associate pastor for several years. Then I moved to a Global Orphan Project, and I was building orphanages in Haiti and loving that. And then I went to sporting. How many years ago did you go to sporting? Uh, it's been 10 years. So I, I started there in 2012, um, and I got there because the founders of Cerner are the owners of, um, the majority owners of sporting. And so, so they knew me and they brought me over and uh, and it's been a blast. So starting in 12 is when they won their first trophy under their current ownership, okay. which was an open cup. And then 13, we won MLS Cup. And I was thinking, this is fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm loving this. But it's uh, what you the culture that you sense when you're in the stadium is the culture of the team and the culture of the staff. It's a great group of people. I love working with them. Very cool. Yeah. I want to dial backwards just a little bit. Sure. Um, so did was it Neil Patterson that hired you for Cerner? Yeah, it was Neil. Um, okay. He passed away now um, three and a half years ago. But uh, yeah, Neil and Cliff actually were the two that did the final interviews. And what, uh, did, what position did you take with Cerner when you came to Kansas City? What I was, was uh, I started as a director of marketing and then I got into kind of a sales and service leadership role. And then my last few years there, I was chief marketing officer. Okay. So they they gave me a tremendous amount of different experiences. So I think I grew more in that time period mm -hmm. in my life than any other time period. Yeah. And how, what year did they did Cerner start? Uh, Cerner was... started in 1979. Okay. And then they went public in '85. Okay. And then I started there in 90 and, um, you know, and then they just sold yeah. to Oracle. Recently. Yeah, recently. Yeah. As in, well, it, it isn't 
completed yet, but yeah, about a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> and all the shareholders are going, yes. Oh, God. Me included. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. So I remember reading um, a, I always read a lot of business books, even though I was a pastor. And uh, I remember reading Peter Drucker mm. about um, organizational structure and how if you every every 50 percent of growth i can't remember the exact percentage but somewhere in that range every every time you grow 50 percent your your structure usually falters and so it's almost like you have to like reinvent your structure for all these different growth phases right yeah and I mean, the church was definitely like that in terms of growth of people, like a church of 50 people or 100 people or 200 people is very different from a church of 1,000 or 2,000. Um, and, you know, I, I, I remember like a church growth consultant saying, you know, you know, church mega churches aren't just bigger, they're different. Meaning <laughs> that, you know, they, they just operate it's a different animal. So yeah. if you were at Cerner and you're saying that you were experiencing, you doubled every two years yeah. when you were at Cerner. So you were there from 90 till. To 03. So you saw this thing double every two years for 13 years. With, what did you see structure wise? Was it? Uh, I saw a tremendous <laughs> amount of change. <laughs> And one of the things I would say that that both Neil and Cliff, they were this tremendous partnership. You know, they were they were each uniquely gifted and they worked their gifts out to kind of blend together to make a whole, so to speak. But they were both continually looking at how do we reorganize? How do we structure? How do we take a role that we had defined, you know, years ago to be this and now it's got to be something different? And so it was fascinating. It, mm. I learned a lot more than I would have, or than I did in my master's program mm. while I was there. You know, just watching this company go through these growing pains, and and it got into a lot of different things. Like, how do you, as you get this large, how do you keep that same passion in the people as you had when you were small? You know, when everyone was close, and you know, you had a meeting, and everybody in the company came, and now you're spread out ge geographically, and all these things, and. So that was, those were fun challenges. And I, the people that worked there were just incredibly smart. So when you got into a room and you're working on a problem, there was a lot of creativity that came to bear. Uh, and in many ways I, I would sit there and think, we ought to be writing the business book now. <laughs> you know, this is a really fascinating experiment that mm. we're doing here. Like what, I'm just kind of curious, like at 13 years at Cerner and of course, you know, the during those years, I remember having people in my church that were working for Cerner <laughs> and, you know, they're, the, you know, the rub was that, you know, you got to give them your life yeah, to work there. You much. know, I mean, that was, yeah, that was like, especially in the nineties. I mean, the culture was you, I mean, you just, you live there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, and they tried to keep that going a long, long time, right? They did. Um, we did, I should say, because I was there and I was, <laughs> you know, motivated to try and accomplish what I thought our potential was. Mm -hmm. That was the real, I think that was the real challenge is if you understood where Cerner was going, you realized that it was an exciting future and that you had to do a lot in your niche to help them get there. So, so there was kind of the, the expectation as well as the opportunity to work a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but it was very hard. Mm -hmm. It was very hard. I, uh, I, I just <laughs> remember coming home and you know having that precious time with the kids before they would go to bed, and them being kind of spent mm -hmm. because there was just a lot going on, and you were your mind was kind of constantly working on it, even if you weren't in the office. You were mm -hmm. you were trying to figure things out mm -hmm. about where to go. And so, so that was definitely part of the culture. And I think the challenge is, as we got larger is the people who were farther away from what the vision and the mission of the company was, it was more difficult for them to understand why to engage and, and to work that hard. Mm -hmm. But 
a lot of a lot of long hours there yeah sure. yeah I, i'm curious um i don't know if you can do that but like if you were to think about that 13 years at cerner what were some of the key maybe leadership or business organization lessons that you feel like you like if you had to just maybe two yeah you know just a couple that you came away with that you really that really stuck with you that you, you think are worth like imparting Sharing. to other people <laughs> all right these two <laughs> one other people may have experienced in different settings but this really came to bear in my life my personal life uh at Cerner, which was that i can do a lot more than i believe i can and breaking through that whatever you want to call it a glass ceiling to say i actually can can do what's being asked of me or I can, I can actually do what is being offered to me in like a new position, a new role, that type of thing. Um, that is a, that's kind of a profound learning element for me okay. when I discovered that about myself. And I realized I, I wasn't the only one that was that way. You know, a lot of people there could, but they would continually, continually give, because of the growth rate, you a, an opportunity for a tremendous amount of responsibility. Mm. And you would look at it and you go, I have no experience in this. I've never done this before. Uh, you know, there are inherent problems in this area that they're asking me to take over, whatever it might be. And then you would just do it. You'd jump in and you would do it and you'd figure it out and you'd accomplish it. And you'd look back and go, okay, we did this, you know? So that was one, it was just the ability to, to not listen to that voice that says, I'm not sure you can do this. You know, you don't mm -hmm. have any experience. You, you just say, yeah, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll handle it. Uh, so, so that was one. And now I had a second one uh, and uh, and it's uh, escaping me. It, it was a, uh, oh yes, th this is kind of a fun one that Cerner was really good at, which is if you're doing something new, what you wanna do is you want to kind of articulate what the new thing is and then claim the leadership position of it. And that was something they were very effective at doing. And I'll give you an example. Uh, but it applies, obviously, in a, in a lot of different areas. Um, healthcare IT systems were, you know, traditionally a certain way. And so Cerner came and, and one of the terms that they used was electronic medical record. So they used this term to say this is the future of healthcare automation. Everything in the medical record is in the computer. And then they immediately claimed the leadership position of this new industry okay. where it was going. Okay. They were very effective at doing that. They were competing against companies that were 20, 30, 40 times their size. Mm -hmm. And they would catch the attention of the industry. Interesting. By doing it that way. And I, I just, I kind of ah, found that fascinating. That is interesting. That was actually a Neil Patterson kind it of. It takes a uh, big ego. <laughs> it does. <laughs> You know, like um, to think about being the little guy on the street coming up with something and then claiming the leadership like we're the we're the yeah. innovator leaders on this thing. right? Yes. Here. Yes. He he had that. Uh -huh. He had that moxie. I would say. <laughs> it was a bit of a David and Goliath. Uh -huh. thing. Yeah, really. He had right. he was he was David. He was I am not scared. We're going to do this. They're doing it the wrong way. We got the right. Yeah. Way. And uh, it takes that, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And then it takes a lot of people to, to right. make that happen. Right. That's where Cliff, I, I always saw Cliff kind of being a genius, was Neil would kind of cast this big, exciting thing, and then Cliff would figure out how to get the company there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was fun. Wow. I enjoyed it. <clears throat> That's cool. So after Cerner, you went to career-wise, where'd you go? So, um, and this was something between my wife and I, uh, we had talked about this for actually years, that we felt called into ministry. Both of us did. That was always a confirming sign hmm. for me is that I was thinking it, I was feeling it, I thought I was hearing it, and then she was having the same sign. So, um, so for several years, I worked on staff at a church um, where I was over like small groups and adult ministries and all of those singles. How ministries. many years did you do that? I did that for four years. Four years. Yeah. Your Pastor Dietrich. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I don't, I don't so trying to think from, if anybody ever called me that. Yeah. But yeah. So you went from marketing 
chief marketing Guru, officer of to, Cerner, that yeah. was this skyrocketing company to pastoral. Yeah. And that's that's a big transition. It seems like. Yeah, I don't think I could have done a bigger transition. <laughs> yeah. It was it was a polar opposite of my Cerner experience. And as I look back and I was like, all right, so why? We were really sure that God called me uh -huh. into this. So why did he do that? And I think it was to open me up to um, a whole nother way of leading and managing and and living, so to speak, that was different from my corporate life. Okay. So it was talk a, about that. Unpack, <laughs> unpack that for us. Okay. Uh, so some of my biggest <clears throat> challenges, I think, were one was everyone that I worked with because there were so many people going to this church and there were so many ministries I was responsible for. But everyone that I worked with was a volunteer. Very different than my corporate life, right? Mm -hmm. Where everyone you work with works for you and, you know, you do their performance reviews and and incentivize them and all that. And these are all volunteers. So it just took a very different uh, leadership style for me to develop more relationally with these folks and um, kind of learn what motivates them and what their passion is. And hmm. and and then also uh, coming to a point where I was in a position to ask of volunteers, you know, like this is what my expectation of you is, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, uh, so that was a big growth environment for me. I think uh, another big growth uh, area for me, and I enjoyed doing it, was uh, just the preaching side. Because I didn't do it often, just a few times a year, but mm -hmm. it was a large church. And what you did every week and what you were so gifted at, Fred, and I mean that sincerely because I've I listened to you and I, I actually went and saw you speak. Um, you know, I felt that coming into it and I had done business kind of talks, mm -hmm. but now this word that I loved and I've studied for years, now you get to teach it, Yeah, you know, yeah. and how to make that interesting and engaging and hold them and maybe they'll walk away with something and then a challenge on how to do something new in their life. You bet. So that was fun. That yeah. was a fun challenge for me. I, I, honestly, my, my first time I did it, I was very anxious. Yeah. You know, all right. So here's the, here's an embarrassing moment. My first time to preach because we did Saturday night and Sundays like you did right. in church. And so that day I woke up and um, it was the spring and I was thinking I was feeling spring allergies. So I took some Sudafed. Uh -oh. You know what Sudafed is? You know, it dries up. Your... Uh -huh. So anyway, I get in there to preach and my mouth and my dry. throat is dry. Oh, that's miserable. <laughs> I know. I know. I was you know, like the words. You can't hardly get them out. Exactly. No, that was it. That was my first preaching. I've experience. had that happen. Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, so so the volunteer thing is interesting to me yeah. because um, I, I was told this. I, I've never verified it, but I, I heard that. Harvard Business School and their MBA program would have their students at some point they in, they implemented where they had to go study a volunteer driven organization because they wanted you know you think about a volunteer driven organization like people aren't doing what they're doing for a paycheck yeah. right and uh you know, like they're like literally I, my volunteers were they were given their time. They were given their money. They were given their energy. All because they believed in the mission. That's right. And I guess the idea of the business school was that like that the corporate world needs to become missional so that people aren't just working for paychecks, but mm -hmm. they're, they're working for something deeper because uh, I always heard even from the business world, paychecks are short term motivators. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you once you've gotten your paycheck for a while, it does, it's not really what makes you tick anymore. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, and in this market today, honestly, uh, with the all the open jobs, it's like I can always go work somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think we're shifting more and more actually into an, an environment where associates or employees need that same kind of leadership style that you have in a in a local in a volunteer driven organization yeah, yeah 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 and i 
so that that was always interesting to me, you know, yeah. because yeah, and then it's a much higher form of leadership. I think it is, and and then like you're saying, like I, where I learned to lead leader, like I would do a job description for a volunteer, and I taught my staff to do this, just like I would if I was paying somebody, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and you know, kind of like here's yeah, how many hours, expectations, you know, yeah, what, and I would, you know, we and we and then even even to try to give feedback to volunteers in terms of, you know, performance. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, it's like, oh really? You can do that to a volunteer? And I, <laughs> every now and then out of this, you know, because we worked with obviously thousands of volunteers over the course of years, but you know, every now and then I, I like, I, I remember one volunteer that we had, one of my pastors like fired him. <laughs> like, I mean, they, and they didn't, they didn't do it. They tried to transition them, right? Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But who fires a volunteer? I was a volunteer. How do you get fired? You know, like she was pissed <laughs> out. Like she came to me complaining uh, about the situation. I had, there's a and, great Andy. Stanley. And I love this girl. You yeah, know, this yeah. gal. She was and, just in the wrong place. And, uh, yeah, it just wasn't the right fit. And and so, you know, I tried to talk her through. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, there's a, I heard Andy Stanley say this and it really struck me. He said, um, in that kind of situation, he, he went to the Christ example and he said, Christ is, as Christ is our example, you never see the many suffering for the one. You always saw the one suffering for the many, mm. meaning if you had one that was causing many to suffer, you had to turn it around and fix that. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, that stuck with me. I thought that. Yeah. That, that is a, that's a tough side of this. It, because it's a hard side because mo feelings can get hurt. You know, you got a great person that's given time, money, energy. Yeah. But then it's not the right fit. And, and then you open yeah. up a door to they feel gossip and all of those things yeah. that that ripple out of a situation like that. But yeah. you've got to do the right thing. Yeah. Or yeah, it's, it's going to affect more. So many challenges, right? Well, interesting. So then you went from the church to what? So, uh, so my what ended my time with the church was my mother had come to the end of her battle with cancer. So I left um, there your, to care for her. Your mother? Yeah, my mother. Okay. And uh, um, and so, and then after she passed, I stayed around, this is in Ohio, and I stayed around with my dad for a while uh, because of the challenges I knew he'd be facing. I wanted to kind of get him set and ready to go, so to speak. So I just, I left the church. And then when I came back from that, I had been traveling with Global Orphan Project to Haiti just as a you know, individual who was passionate mm -hmm. about the work they were doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then they asked me to come on staff. And so I did there. And it, interestingly enough, it was about nine months, I think, if I got my math right, about nine months after my mother passed, my wife was diagnosed uh, with cancer. So I, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't know the mother. I always thought you left the church because of your wife situation. Gotcha. No, it was, it was your uh, mother. It was my mother. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was like God was training me, um, so to speak. Interesting. Yeah, with my mother's situation, how to handle someone hmm. who has cancer. So interesting. And especially the end part, which is, uh, hmm. you know, in many ways, it's the most difficult time is that end phase of their life here. Mm hmm. And so, yeah, I, I mm. learned a lot through that experience that I could bring into the next one wow. and kind of help my kids too as yeah. we go through that, you know? Wow. So many, so, so many challenges in life, right? Yes. Mm. Yeah, that was. And, and honestly, <clears throat> with my wife's situation, I would say that that was probably a period of time because she, she battled for four and a half years, where you, you read in the Bible about the, the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you think you know what it means until you're facing a situation where emotionally and, and even physically, it's, it's more than you can handle. Mm. And that's when I felt that kind of miraculous hand mm of the Holy Spirit to mm. come in and give me wisdom, um, be my, you know, 
my place to lean on mm. talking with God about how I'm processing this emotionally. Also giving me wisdom how to deal with my kids and helping them to deal with this mm -hmm. and being her care provider. Mm. And, and there was times you're tired. So for our audience who doesn't know the story. Yeah. So you you left the church world you'd been pastor for four years yeah and went to care for your mother and you did you move your whole family no they stayed here okay. because the kids were in school okay okay so and how was, old were your kids at this point um they were probably elementary and junior okay like elementary up to junior high okay and then your mother died of cancer yes then you came back to Kansas City. I mean, you were bouncing around, but yeah. And then came went to work with Global Orphan Project full time. Yes, yeah. And I was, uh, I was uh, traveling to Haiti every month. Describe for people what Global Orphan Project is, just in case they don't know. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it's <clears throat> it's grown and changed a lot with time. Uh, Global Orphan at that time would would um, build um, orphanages on the campus with churches, and then they would support that church financially to be able to provide school for the kids and clothing and food and care, health care as well as um, what we called mamas, which were women who would come and watch the kids. Mm -hmm. So that was early Global Orphan. They've evolved into doing so many other exciting things since then, including online stuff and stuff here in the States, mm -hmm. as well as other countries all over the world, really. Um, but at that time, we were primarily focused in Haiti. So yeah, I was going over there every month. Mm. And I was uh, just, we were building orphanages in, in, in 2000. What year was this? Well, it, it started in 08. In 2010, um, they had that earthquake in Haiti. Right. And so. It what was, year did you start working with Global Orphan? 08. 08. Okay. Uh, so in 10, I was over there and we, um, you know, I mean, it was chaos in mm -hmm. Haiti. So many children that had. Uh, whose parents had been crushed in the earthquake, but because they're smaller, they could get out and escape. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, they were they were yeah. helpless. Yeah, that was uh, that was a, a powerful time there, and I developed some lifelong friendships hmm. uh, over there and learned a lot. I learned a lot about different cultures and how the Haitian culture is different from the American culture, and we can't turn them into Americans. The American culture, right. you know what I mean? See, how do you yeah. how do you work in that environment? Right. That was a that was a big growth experience, mm. and seeing the hand of God over there. Mm. Um, it's a it was predominantly um, or a large presence of voodoo mm -hmm. as the as the religion there, and so when you have something that kind of dark and oppressive, there is a dramatic difference between the darkness and the light. Mm -hmm. Where it's where it's much more um, subtle here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I went lots there. Of, lots of Haiti stories. Yeah, I went there once after the earthquake with um, Convoy of Hope, and then I went there uh, once with Global Orphan Project. It was like one of that fundraiser that they did with the bike ride. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I did the bike ride. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. Derek Scarberry, that's somebody else name that came to mind. Do you know Derek? Yeah, I know yeah, Derek. Yeah, he was he did the ride too. He was a good Yeah, boy. he Derek was at, at at Vineyard for quite a while and then they moved south. Yeah, and, they're down in Florida like Tampa. But, well, yeah, but they moved to the south part of Kansas City oh, initially. I got gotcha. you. So they I I hated to lose them. Yeah. But yeah, now they live in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Derek was on that trip. I'm trying to think, you know, Joe Fox um was put it you know help help mike fox put it together yeah joe fox owns cycle city and uh yeah i had one of my close friends scott rogers went on that trip i remember um ivy was one ivy of the, whitman uh-huh yeah was one of the I think guys in colorado now happened help coordinate that whole trip i think but yeah it was, it was very a, different for haiti it was an interesting Seeing trip. Seeing a bunch of guys yeah. ride bikes through. Yeah, we were in, we we built up these Cannondale mountain bikes, basically. And then we had a ton of other Cannondale bikes that we were giving away mm -hmm. at each of the orphanages that we we would ride into these orphanages, you know. It was, yeah. It was a really interesting trip. But, <laughs> yeah. That's fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have, I have a lot of special memories there. And, um, and I had done that, I had, interestingly enough, I had worked with him for four years. And, uh, and through that time, my wife is battling cancer. So I would travel to Haiti when she was having a good week. And then I would come back and she'd have her chemo and I'd be around for the resulting day, uh, days and uh, about a week after. So that. she was battling cancer from 08 to, to 12. To 12. Yeah. And she, she, she passed, passed away in, in 12. 12. Okay. What kind of cancer was she? It had? um it started ovarian and then it spread. Yeah, that's a tough part about that cancer is uh, once they detect it, it's typically they detect it because it's spread. And with cancer, when it's spread, it's a lot bigger battle. Um, but what was so miraculous about my wife is she was always positive, hmm. always hopeful, always joy filled through it. Wow. You know, and she did chemo nonstop for four and a half years, oh. basically every week and or not every week, but every month, one week, three weeks off, one week, three weeks off. And, um, you know, and I, I, saw that having a huge impact on my kids mm. just watching they, her by this time they're in they're high, in high school, high school or college, college yeah. and um and you know the other miraculous thing she did during this time is she was always a great mom and then she kind of cranked it up you know in terms of just being that much more invested in their lives and mm. loving them and she did have the tendency to do whatever they wanted <laughs> <laughs> during that phase. So I was the bad cop. You know, I would be like, no, no, we can't do that. <laughs> but it was just sweet. She imprinted on them. They'll, they will never forget that time. Mm. I mean, my kids won't. Uh, and I think that they learned a lot from her about faith mm. and perseverance. Oh. I did... I've got this story. Um, so when she, her, her end to her battle came pretty quickly and she was in the hospital and, and as with a lot of cancer patients, when they get to a stage and their pain is such, they move to a, a morphine IV. Yeah. And that usually means that they're, they're yeah. going to kind of be out right. uh, most of the time sleeping mm -hmm. and uh, and so she was in that phase so my daughter had come from college and she said dad you look really tired why don't you go home tonight and sleep i'll stay here with her so i went home and it was about seven o'clock at night and i immediately fell asleep and and literally and i mean this when i say this god woke me up at about four o'clock in the morning and i just felt that kind of whisper saying you need to get into the hospital hmm. so i didn't know what it was and i was hoping nothing bad had happened and that my daughter was having a difficult time. So I literally, I just went right into the hospital. And as I'm walking into her room, the nurse, they, they had changed shifts and the nurse is coming out. And I guess, you know, because she'd been laying on her back a long time, they rolled her on her side and she never slept on her side. And that jarred her awake. And so as I'm walking in, she's laying there and her eyes are open and she hadn't had her eyes open for like four days and she was completely lucid. And so I just walked over to her, you know, like, hi, babe, how are you? And mm. She said, I think I'm okay. How are you? And we had this little conversation about her mm. folks and about my kids. Sweet. You know, we got to tell each other that we loved each other. Mm. And then shortly after that, she rolled back over onto her back and she was immediately asleep again. And then she died later that day. Wow. Yeah. And I just thought, what a sweet blessing from God that we had mm. that moment together. You so know? interesting. Yes. I mean, wow. that that's a miracle. Yeah. Wow. Gives me chills. Yeah. If I had stayed there that night, I would have slept mm. through that, you know? Yeah. I would have missed it. But God mm. had kind of planned that whole thing for us. That's amazing. It was sweet. There, It is. I've I've never had a, a close family member go through that but i've gone through it with some some people that i was close to in the church to where i was you know i'd walk through and even been present with people in their last breath you know kind of mm -hmm. thing yeah and there was it seemed like there was always something that happened that you know that would be a sign from from god that you know so many times it would 
happen and you're just like oh wow well, you know because it's it's such a hard time but it's just uh yeah mm. grateful for those little for those mm -hmm. moments where god shows up in in pain and suffering you know yeah yeah well and i had somebody who who is not a believer mm -hmm. uh not religious or a faith person in any regard mm -hmm. and and he said to me after death and I, I could tell he wanted to retract it once he said it <laughs> but he said you know i thought all of that faith stuff that you have would have gotten you something and as soon as he said it you know i could see like where he's like wow i i really that was harsh i shouldn't have said that and it gave me the opportunity to say oh it gave me so much more you mm -hmm. know i mean i realized that now she's free in paradise mm -hmm you know where i look forward to being mm. i realize i have a mission here to complete mm -hmm. you know and and all of the imperfection that we deal with here right um but i couldn't imagine a greater place for her to be than there mm. yeah interesting and just selfish of me to want to keep her right well but you know, and, I, and I'm not criticizing myself for that. I'm just saying that, yes, of course, I'd want her to stay. But but yeah, I wouldn't want to deny her a moment mm. from there either. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Heavy um, stuff. So, well, thanks for sharing that. I, I appreciate it. Um, what you before. So you were at Global Orphan. Mm -hmm. Were you still working with them when you're wife passed uh no i actually moved over to sporting at the beginning of 12 and she passed in october of okay 12. okay so i'd i'd been with uh sporting for nine months okay so i'm curious because i'm gonna then i'm gonna spend the rest of time on sporting kc but okay but the uh but i am curious like from glo from that four years at global orphan mm -hmm. what like what would be a, a key lesson that you feel like you learned there that you that that's worth passing on <laughs> well it'd be uh, uh I, there's a few uh one of the things i really kind of enjoyed and respected about mike fox is mike really wanted us to run a good ship if that makes sense meaning we work hard we um we make sure that we are very sensitive to use our donors money the way they're intended that there's not waste of that and um and so i really respected that kind of discipline that we had mm. over there because when you go into a different culture it's easy to not operate that way mm. that culture does not operate that way mm -hmm. right and yeah. so we couldn't change the culture but we could we could at least do what we had control over in a in a in an efficient and an effective manner mm -hmm. um and we were also very dependent very dependent on god's miraculous hand mm -hmm. to go before us and mm -hmm. to make things happen there were several things that would occur over there that you're like eh, i don't see how this is going to get done unless god wants it and, and he moves some mountains and he would move mountains mm. and so i got to see those miracles yeah. in that way and i guess another one that i would say I kind of alluded to this earlier is the um this will be a subject a lot of people will you know struggle with but there is satan and when he is worshipped that aggressively in a culture, um, that evil and that darkness is is a is a presence you can sense. And um, the, and I had a lot of different run-ins with that. Mm. And um, and the light of our faith is stronger mm. and overpowers it. Mm. And you hear it and you think it, but it. When you experience it in mm. that way, that's a that's a real powerful thing. Interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've 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 talked to friends that are atheist or agnostic, and you know they're not sure about any kind of supernatural evil. Yeah, and and I I, I always ask them like just right up, you know, like well, like you know, what do you what do you think? Because they they won't deny that they feel like there's evil, 
I say, what about supernatural evil? <laughs> you know, and then they're not really sure about anything supernatural, yeah. right? So, but, but like, I, I, I've seen things that are hard to describe otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, and I've had hundreds and hundreds of people describe to me situations where they felt like they had encounters with supernatural evil, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, raise the hair on the back of your neck, you know, kind of thing, like, you know, and so. It changes you too. Yeah. When I've, you have an encounter with it, mm -hmm. you, um, you sense it differently, mm -hmm. I think, going forward. Yeah. 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 Well, so Sporting KC, um, of course, you know, it's so much, you know, even coming off of a great season this year, right? Yeah. Um, I, there's so much excitement around Sporting <laughs> KC. I mean, my friends that are avid Chiefs fans, uh, so many of them are avid Sporting KC fans. Cool. And you've been there since 2012. So you've seen, what, what year did that get kicked off? I was... Uh, so the the league uh, started in '96, and was called the Wizards at that time, um, the Wiz, and then the Wizards. Um, that started in at that period of time, and then our current ownership acquired the team from the Hunts in '07, okay. end of '06 into '07. So that's when Neil Patterson and Cliff Illig were the majority owners. Um, Rob Heineman, Pat Curran, and Greg Madey were the others at that time. Now, um, Pat Mahomes has joined. I heard, which is really cool. Uh, he's a, he was a great supporter of ours before yeah. he came under the ownership right. side. Um, but anyway, and so with them, 2012 was was kind of a fun year. We opened the new stadium in June of 11, and so 12 was the first year that we had. The full season with the stadium, we were sold out uh, that year, the entire year, and uh, we won our first championship under the current ownership, and so that was exciting. Mm -hmm. That was that was a lot of fun. And, and the cool thing about the culture then was that sporting was was trying and doing new and different things that weren't being done by other MLS soccer clubs or other pro sports, and so you know that was where we would just try things and. Sometimes they wouldn't work and sometimes they wouldn't. Our fans would enjoy it and we'd be like, all right, let's do more of this. Huh. But I would say fan experience, that focus on fan experiences, I, two things, focus on fan experience and a real passion starts at ownership to Peter Vermees of winning. You, you put those two together and you, uh, you, you get something cool. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm cause you described, you said from the team culture to the 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 staff the staff culture yeah to the fan culture do you feel like there's a congruence there i do um, i feel like um i feel like the fans and i'm curious as to kind of bond to is that culture they perceive been, has it been like a strategic cultural development like cultural architecture that goes into that like is it something you guys like hey we want to build this kind of culture very much so very thoughtful yeah um from the you know from since i can remember starting they were very thoughtful about yes yeah, so what, what are the key elements of your like what are your cultural values that you're constantly uh great question to put in there uh, so it we do this like associate survey every year mm -hmm. and we have them free text describe what they think our culture is and we really use that to go is that what we want to be you know because what our people think and believe is is very powerful and i think we've got really good alignment with that um innovation is is very important to us continually looking for ways to do things new and different and better um and a lot of times that involves technology but there's just new things you can try mm -hmm. uh for your fans i i believe that it's um we, we kind of use a word work hard play hard so we're very diligent and, and very passionate about kind of w what we're working on and the business that we have, the business of this team. And uh, and then we enjoy each other's company uh, and we have fun with with our staff or, or with our families afterwards. So, mm -hmm. so we make sure that that we do create a balance there. Um, I think the and this is really powerful with Peter and the team, but but it fits us as well. He'll describe it as, um, you know, the talk about you are a team. It's not individuals. Uh, 
it's a team and that's huge on both sides mm. and it you like gosh doesn't every business book say that yeah but you tend to get you know individuals emerge who want to be you know, who want to have something all about them and uh and on both sides we manage that very closely where we keep it as a, we mm. are a team we mm -hmm. all work together we all of us here have very important roles. Nobody, you might have this title, you might have that title, but it takes all of us working together to pull it off. Mm. It's very much the way soccer is too, mm -hmm. you know? You might have some stars, mm. uh, you have some great players who score a lot of goals, but it takes that, all of that, the great mm -hmm. goalie and all of that mm -hmm. just to make it work together. Yeah, And, and you've got to fight for that. It's, it's, it's almost like the, there is a pressure that some people want to emerge as a as there as a single mm -hmm. you know superstar so to speak or whatever and uh, that creates a kind of a an imbalance and mm -hmm. so you've, you've got to work um to fight that yeah. i i would say too i'd say we do have an obsessive focus on fan experience an obsessive focus on fan experience <laughs> so we look at it a thousand different ways you know from the people side or the process side or the the facility side and the programs that we run and all those things and it's just something that um we think about constantly mm. i i believe that is why you would have someone who would be a passionate fan of the chiefs and also sporting because in some ways they're going to be you know just very different experiences mm. and they like both mm -hmm. mm. yeah so um what I'm just curious in your time there, what uh, are there some fun stories that are kind of behind the scenes stories that people wouldn't have known about um, that that are worth telling? Yeah, here here's one. <laughs> um, so we won MLS Cup in 2013. And like the other pro sports, the winner of that gets to go to the White House and you get to meet the president and he honors you in the in the in the white house and uh, so we had that that whole experience and it was just awesome walking around the white house oh, you cool. know and i mean that was all fun but that's kind of what everyone would know right all right so then congressman yoder um arranges to have us go to the capitol building and he gives us a tour of the capitol now this is the really cool thing so then we're walking up on this floor and the windows, they're very tall windows, but they start about three feet off the floor, right? They're these old original kind of window things. And he opens the window and he said, step through here. You're like stepping through a window. What are we stepping out onto? And so we stepped out onto this like porch patio that's in the Capitol building. And it was a wine and cheese party out there. Huh. And we're looking the lawn over at the Washington Monument. Oh, wow. I mean, that was just so cool. Was, <laughs> it, was, like, was it a party that they just put on for you? No, was it was it an existing just, party and he and was bringing just, us into it. Wow. You know, you, I have no idea who the other people were who were out there, but we felt like it was just for us. That's amazing. Yeah. So that um, uh, that was a blast. Yeah, I, I really love that. I would say the other uh, thing that a lot of people don't see, we have a partnership with uh, Children's Mercy and a lot of our players really get into that. And there are several players who kind of connect with a patient and then they go on to be a part of that patient's life. And there was one player who, um, uh, he wouldn't want me to say his name, but he bonded with a patient, a cancer patient, a child going through treatments there. And he ended up going back and spending three days with that child when that child came to the end of his battle with cancer, hmm. just stayed in the room with the kid. Wow. Yeah. Through, uh, through all of that. And, um, mm. that, that kind of, that's cool. Uh, generosity and compassion by our players is I, I don't have experience with other teams to mm. know if that's common, but it, it's just a real beautiful thing. And, and that partnership is kind of, blessed us in that. That's why we did the foundation for kids with cancer is because it's such a, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing to see a child go through. Mm -hmm. So you want to do whatever you can to help them in their battle, hopefully succeed mm -hmm. and or make that time as, as pleasant for them as possible. But our, our players are just very humble and compassion and generous people in that regard. And, uh, and I've enjoyed that a lot. That's, That's awesome. something I didn't expect. Yeah. You know? 
Wow, that's cool. Did you have a love for soccer before you started <laughs> working with Sporting KC? You know, I grew up playing soccer um, oh, okay. as a kid. Yeah, wow. it was in Cincinnati. It's kind of a German town and soccer was really big oh, there. Wow. So you started okay. at five. Because a lot of people our age, like I didn't grow up playing soccer. Yeah. It was like one two week PE class like one year out of my whole middle school, <laughs> high school career. That's your soccer experience. Well, and then what was interesting was when I went to Baylor, I ended up being the intramural sports director at Baylor. So I was in charge of putting all of the open leagues, fraternity and sorority leagues together, had to book fields and had to uh, supply refs for everything. And soccer <laughs> was the one we had the hardest time getting refs for because Nobody, even, at, even in the eighties, a lot of people hadn't grown up playing soccer. So I literally had to learn to ref soccer <laughs> and learning to ref soccer. I had to, I, I started playing with the guys and yeah. started learning skills. And so that's where I, that's where you picked it uh -huh. up. It was at Baylor. <laughs> that's but, pretty cool. Yeah. You had to teach it. Then you had to, yeah, I had to had learn, to learn the rules to actually ref a game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would love to hear you explain offside. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what's funny is I, we had two of our biggest fraternities, you know, and they compete all year long on all the sports, all the points, and the cumulative point winner wins the, that's the biggest prize for these fraternities to win. And yeah. it came down to one last soccer game. And I had to, and I was reffing it. And I, <laughs> I called the offsides that oh. cost one of the sororities, oh. I mean, not sororities, the fraternities, the, the whole prize for the whole year. Yeah. Oh, they hated me. <laughs> 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 that, I bet. I bet. And I, I stood by it. I like, oh, yeah, you know, of course yeah. I was a hero to the one. Yeah, that's right. Well, there was no video review. Back exactly. So you're like, yeah, I just called it the way I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I played as a kid up yeah. until high school. And then I stopped at high school. Um, football was the predominant sport then. Mm -hmm. God, I actually did cross country too. Oh, mm. Lord. I did that. It's a tough sport, in my opinion. Yeah. It was a tough sport. I was good at that, but anyway. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> I think I was okay. I did win a race once, so I'll, oh, I'll hey, hang on to that. There you go. But, uh, but anyway, um, so I had always loved soccer. It was the first sport that I really connected with. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my eye-foot coordination came a lot quicker than my eye-hand coordination, mm -hmm. so it was natural there. And um, But... When I was working for Global, Cliff Illig reaches out to me, says he wants to talk to me about, he says, I understand you're doing this cool work in Haiti, but I'd like to talk with you. And I had a, such tremendous respect for the man. I was like, I couldn't imagine leaving what I was doing, but I'm like, yes, I will talk with you, of course. And uh, <laughs> three hours of talking to him, I started to envision not only what I thought I could do with sporting, but also the fact that there were people at Global who could take over what I was doing and step into those roles and probably doing better than I was. And that's the case. There was a guy there, Jake, and he's done a phenomenal job uh, taking over what I was doing. So anyway, so I was driving home from that time with Cliff and I called my wife. And so I'm talking with her about, you know, this job and, and working with the team and all of these cool things. And, um, and after she passed, I found a notebook where she had taken notes from that call. Hmm. She'd like circled things and, you know, underlined things that she and I had talked about. And that was always kind of this sign to me that um, that I was stepping into what God had hmm. called me to do when, you know, cool. she was kind of feeling the same sign as I was. Yeah. Feeling. Yeah. So that was fun. Very good. Good Very times. Good. Yeah. Fun stuff. Well, and then, you know, football yes. is the biggest universal worldwide sport that there is, right? Yes. And yes. so, like, even when I would go to do mission trips, like, to South America and Africa, one of the things, we'd always take soccer balls with us. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, a white guy playing soccer in South America or in Africa, which I've done both, uh, draws a crowd. <laughs> and uh, kids love it. Mm -hmm. and so the kids play with me and I would, you know, I'm terrible. So it's even more fun, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, they can take it away from but, you. And but it draws you. a huge crowd and, the, you know, the adults stand around uh. and laugh and watch. And then it, then you just start engaging and it, yes. it just was ended up being 
I, I, I have such fond memories. Of, I, <laughs> I've played soccer in South America and Africa. And, you know, That's okay. cool. Yeah, it's fun. It was big in Haiti, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We would bring balls and they will, they will play with anything, though. It doesn't have to be a ball. Right. right. And we would bring shoes. You know, yeah. people would donate shoes. It was a beautiful thing. And we would see the kids wear their shoes for a little while and then kick them off. They actually preferred playing in their bare feet. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You I've, guys are tough. I've played with kids in Haiti too. Play soccer with kids <laughs> yeah. in Haiti too. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, hey, fun. um, what were what would you say, you know, were a couple of the lessons maybe that you would want to share that you've learned from sporting KC? Mm. Uh very good. Um I've had the opportunity to kind of reflect on this recently, actually. Um I would say something that you we're talking about earlier around volunteers um, really applies to at least to the pro sport world, probably more. And that is that um, you're, we call them associates, the people that work on our staff. You really have to get to know them and what their passions are and how that aligns with their role and with the club. Because the, you know, the time and the hours that you work there, it's half your weekends, you know, the year mm -hmm. you're spending doing this. And that's, that's a lot. And so those have to be kind of an alignment. And um, in other roles, I don't know that I had that as much, you know, mm -hmm. definitely in my CERN role. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, I think my, my learning from the church and from Global Warfare with volunteers kind of applied there. And, and maybe, you know, maybe the bigger lesson is, is that whatever we do, we, we've really got to pay that close attention to what the person, how the, how the kind of the person is architected and what their passions are and how that aligns or doesn't align mm -hmm. with your culture and with their role. Yeah. That's uh, that's a big one. When that works, people accomplish tremendous things, mm. you know, and, mm. And they, they will go above and beyond because they feel so strongly about yeah. what they're doing. So that's one. I would say uh, another one, and this was kind of a lesson from Cerner, but it really applies with sporting, is that um, a lot of times our owners will make investments in things that will make the, the experience or the, the team better and stronger. And you're not going to see a return on that in the short term. But you do that because you're playing the long game, right? You're building towards a bigger, better thing. And um, so I just contrast that a lot of times in, in say, corporate America or, or even in really budget driven organizations where um, you have constrained resources. You. Um, you, you trade those things off. You kick the can down the road. Maybe another year we'll do mm -hmm. that, but not now. And, uh, and I would say with sporting, part of the, the you know, success of it has been because they've always thought about the big, the bigger game. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, we ought to do that. That's cool. That's right. That's new. That's different, you know? And it's an investment. And we're going to figure out a way to, to make that happen. Right. Right. So, uh, so that's, that's very cool. I, I would say the point, another one that I would talk about, that I talked about earlier is this focus on team. We've had, we've had times on both the staff and the, and the team side where, you know, any, an individual emerged as an individual and uh, the dysfunction that kind of comes with that mm. um, is, is very difficult to deal with. So the power of keeping your culture and such and it, and it rests a lot of times with your leadership that because in many cases, the leadership are the ones that want that start to emerge as individuals. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it rests with that leadership to keep that kind of, I would call it humility. Mm. It's, it's an interesting thing because you, you want your, your stars to shine. Yeah. Right. On the flip side, you want them to have the commitment to the team that, causes them to make decisions that aren't always about themselves, right? Yeah. I mean, is that a good that, way that, to say it? That's exactly it. it. Um, you know, in <clears> some <throat> ways, we even work hard to make stars. 
stars, right? Right. Because stars attract you people. Want, yeah, people totally. Want their names on their jerseys and all those things. Yeah. So you want to create stars, but you you have to make create stars out of the people that are very team focused and very. It's an interesting thing. I mean, when I think about players we've had in the past, um, you may not. You may or may not know any of these, but a couple of names come to mind, like Matt Beasler and Seth Sinovic, two guys actually from Kansas City, which is very had very important roles to play for us, but were very humble and very generous mm -hmm. and very team first, and mm -hmm. and that we have there's uh, some guys on our team now, like a guy named Graham Zuzi who's been with us for a long time, and and Roger Espinosa and Tim Melia. You know, I've I've had the real blessing to get to know these men beyond just seeing them perform uh -huh. and they're good men and that's you know character counts character before talent mm. i think applies in every setting mm. you know interesting and a lot of times you know there there's a temptation to trade that off right yeah oh gosh this guy's so good mm -hmm. or if this this lady is so talented mm -hmm. in this role but they don't play well with others. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Kindergarten had it right. So interesting. <laughs> so just for fun, quickly, how about, have you watched Ted Lasso? I love <laughs> Ted Lasso. <laughs> I love Ted Lasso. Well, isn't, isn't there, isn't there a little bit of a Kansas City connection there? Yes. Yeah. Well, he grew up here yeah. in Kansas City. And he has actually done some things for us. Has he? Yes. I was wondering. Jason Sudeikis. Yeah. The, the first thing we did, which was kind of fun, <laughs> if you look back to April Fool's Day of 21, we had um, Rojas, the, 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 I think the Latin player that is like, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we had posted that, that we had just brought him onto our team okay. from their team. And a lot of people who didn't watch Ted Lasso goes, I can't find this guy anywhere. <laughs> who is this guy? What's the big deal about him? But, uh, and then he also did a, uh, um, Jason Sudeikis did his believe sign for us um, when uh, cool. we were approaching the playoffs. Uh, but you know what I really enjoyed is uh, he did an interview, I think it was with GQ magazine, I read it online. Jason Sudeikis, and he talked about his character and, and he used this word, an interesting word, but he, he said, he said, yes, I, there is a lack of decency in our culture today. Mm -hmm. And Ted Lasso represents decency. Like, and I, that, that- I like that. I do too. Yeah. I, it made me think for a huh. while. You know, he's kind of hopeful and optimistic yeah. and he's kind, even in the face of, he said something in, in the third season that I really liked where, uh, it was his kind of trainer, assistant coach guy when he was turning on him and he was saying, you know, you did this to me and you did that to me. And, and mm -hmm. his response was, you know, I'm very sorry. Help me to learn from this. I'm like, wow, that's powerful. Hmm. Help me to learn. From that's this. cool. I don't know that under attack, I would always say, right. Help me to learn from I, this. I might I, say you're wrong. I'm, you know, I'm trying to say that in my life right now. You know, so. <laughs> me too. Yeah, just for for those who don't know, if you haven't seen Ted Lasso, it's it the 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 Jason Sudeikis guy who's from Kansas City, but he's the main character. He was American football coach. Yes. Who ends up going to England to coach a soccer team, <laughs> yeah. a, a, a football team. Yes, yes. They call it football there, you know, but at any rate. Yeah. And it it's a it's a study in leadership mm. and in character and in dig you know yeah, in, in these treating people with dignity, dignity and, and all kinds of things it's very mm -hmm. interesting yes so, yeah, he's actually anyway. hired if you don't know <laughs> because um the ownership of the team over there the husband has divorced the wife and he's having an affair with someone and, and she gets the team and the team is this great love. So she brings Jason Sudeikis over because she thinks he's going to tank the team. Going to fail. And she wants her ex-husband to suffer right. watching that. <laughs> and the whole Jason yeah. Sudeikis character just turns the world upside down, it's, really. It's a, it's a cool story. It is. It, yeah. It's uh, it's very fun. His, his accent in that. <laughs> is not a Kansas City accent, <laughs> but you know you get this feeling of the South. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good show. Apple TV. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for uh, joining us at sure. Spirituality Adventures. Um, man, pleasure. that's some really excellent things that I think people can take from this and 
things to think about. Thank you for sharing as well some of your the pain that you've gone through as well and and how you've gone through that. It's uh, it's inspirational. So thank you. Sure, really, my pleasure. Very, very much appreciate it. Great to uh, spend the time with you, Fred, and and I'm really excited about what you're doing for Spirit spirituality adventures well thank you so much (laughs) all right everybody thanks for tuning in to spirituality adventures and we will see you next time this concludes today's episode thanks for tuning in and listening remember if you're watching on youtube subscribe to my youtube channel remember to like share or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using and then Go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, and make a one-time donation, or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.